In 1889, German scientists attempted to distill a sulfur-based chemical known as thioacetone, which resulted in a wave of nausea, vomiting, and alleged fainting throughout the town. These effects, however, weren't caused by poisoning. They were due entirely to the chemical's unbearable and overwhelmingly powerful stench, which many claim is the worst to ever exist. And the amount required to achieve such widespread agony weighed only 100 grams half as much as a common smartphone. Sounds pretty horrifying, right? Well, when I first heard the stories, I didn't really buy it. After all, how could one chemical smell that strong and be that bad? So a few years ago, I actually made a tiny bit to see how bad it actually was. And as expected, it really wasn't that horrible. At the time, I thought this would be the end of it and I moved on to making chemicals that legitimately smelled way worse. But as time went on, some doubts and new questions emerged. Mainly, how could I be sure I was smelling true thioacetone, and not just its precursor, trithioacetone? I never isolated it, and with such a small amount, any thioacetone that did form would probably repolymerize before I could smell it. Right? These thoughts haunted me for over two years. I wanted to try again, but college, along with all my other projects, kind of pushed the idea of a redo onto the back burner. I mean, what could I possibly do different? And then it hit me. What if I just went bigger? Much bigger. And this time, what if I collected the thioacetone over dry ice, keeping it in its purest, most evil, unpolymerized form until I could smell it? It sounded perfectly foolproof, with no potential downsides. So, that's exactly what I did. This is the story of how I quadrupled the German thioacetone experiment, and kinda got the police and bomb squad called to my house. Now, I probably don't need to say this, but just in case, don't try this at home. The process that I'm about to show involves the use of toxic gases, and the smell it produces is truly the stuff of legends. The only reason I felt comfortable doing this again was because I was working in a fume hood which is pretty much mandatory if you're ever going to try something like this. All right, you've been warned, let's get started. To begin, let's go over what thioacetone actually is, which is kind of given away by its name. Thio means sulfur, and acetone is, well, acetone. So basically, it's acetone with its oxygen swapped for a sulfur. Pretty simple. So, how do we make it? Well, I kind of covered the process back in 2022, along with Nile Red six months later, but I'll go over it again, since the larger scale forced me to make a few changes, and my video skills have significantly improved since then. The three main ingredients are hydrogen sulfide, hydrochloric acid, and you guessed it, acetone. Zinc chloride was also added as a catalyst, since that's what the literature called for. And we might as well count bleach and sodium hydroxide too, since they are kind of necessary to combat the smell. In my first attempt from 2022, I made the hydrogen sulfide by reacting sodium polysulfide with aqueous aluminum chloride. This was mainly because I didn't have all the ingredients that I'll be using in this video, and I didn't want sulfur dioxide forming from the sodium sulfites that were naturally mixed with the polysulfide. My idea was to form aluminum sulfide and aluminum sulfite via double displacement and then have the sulfide selectively decompose in the aqueous solution, while the sulfite remained untouched. I have no clue if this actually worked though, because reports of aluminum sulfite stability in water are... mixed. Either way, I needed a lot more hydrogen sulfide this time, and I didn't feel like the polysulfide pathway would yield the best results for my money and effort. So I decided to go with the more popular route, and the one that Nile Red actually chose for his video, mixing up a batch of iron sulfide and adding hydrochloric acid. To make the iron sulfide, I loaded a bag with iron and sulfur powder, mixed everything really well, and then poured the mix into a giant steel pot. The amounts I went with for this project were 400 grams of iron and 230 grams of sulfur. Upon igniting the mixture with a torch, it slowly began to burn with the flame propagating across the surface. And if you look closely, you can actually see some of the sulfur being vaporized into an orangish cloud near the flame front. This reaction has been shown on video probably a hundred times by now, and it still remains one of the most fun to watch. With the iron sulfide produced, I next moved on to preparing the main solution. For this, I measured out 500 milliliters of Walmart's finest acetone, and added it to a one liter boiling flask equipped with magnetic stirring. 
This was followed by a roughly equal amount of hydrochloric acid, which was also from Walmart and had a roughly 6 molar concentration. This acid is the main catalyst for the reaction, and it will apparently work fine by itself, as shown by Nile Red. However, according to the document that I followed back in 2022, which was definitely not this Wikipedia page, zinc chloride should also be added. So I dumped in an arbitrary amount in hopes that my yield will be slightly more impressive. To avoid tarnishing the credibility of my later results, the zinc chloride bit on Wikipedia was actually cited from some of the original works, and it thankfully wasn't made up by the internet's resident armchair experts. Once all the ingredients were loaded into the flask, I jerry-rigged together a gas bubbler using a three-way clay sand adapter, a rubber hose connected to my least favorite pipette, a rubber stopper, and a gas outlet, which was led into a bubbler trap filled with concentrated sodium hydroxide. A separate flask was then loaded with about a third of my iron sulfide, and fitted with an addition funnel loaded with more hydrochloric acid. And with everything finally ready, I opened the stopcock and began creating my chemical abomination. As the acid was added, hydrogen sulfide gas was evolved and bubbled into the vigorously stirring solution. In theory, this should have been producing trithioacetone, which is the polymerized and still extremely smelly version of thioacetone that is stable at room temperature. However, with the fume hood, I couldn't really smell anything. The sodium hydroxide trap also seemed to be doing a decent job catching most of the residual vapors. So I let the setup run for a day and then shut it down at night. This continued for a few days until I had to go out of town. And that is when things took a turn for the worse. Interesting update to the thioacetone project. The police were called. So I was up somewhere north of here on vacation with my family, and we got a call that about five or six different people complained to the police that they smelled something that they thought was like natural gas. When they asked around, the neighbors basically pointed to my place since they knew that I do chemistry stuff and one thing led to another and here I am at the uh, like, well, I don't know if you can see the clock back there, but it's like 1, 2 a.m. at this point. I had to drive all the way back and uh, clean up some stuff. So. I guess I'll kind of go over what happened. I wanted to revisit the thioacetone synthesis that I did uh, probably about two years now ago. Uh, just because the first time I did it, it was only like a like really small amount. So yeah, I wanted to come back to it for a while and now seemed like a good time because I have the fume hood. And honestly, whenever I had it in the fume hood, everything was going pretty good. You couldn't really smell it inside the house. I tried smelling it outside. You could kind of smell it around the exit of the fume hood, but around here, nothing really smelled. But then I moved it out into the yard because I couldn't really run the fume hood at night. After about, f it's probably been like three or four days now of it running like that. I guess people finally either had enough for it or they finally got enough of it to notice like, something smelled like natural gas. I guess I should mention what happened with the uh, uh, police. We came back here and uh, they had honestly left. So I don't know if they're going to be any kind of follow-ups or maybe even a citation for disturbing the peace or something. Hopefully not. Um, again, nothing I do on this channel is illegal and I don't endorse doing anything illegal, but you know, they, you could technically count this as disturbing the peace because five or six people complained that they smelled something and they got them worried. So, don't ever try anything that I show, but yeah. The legends about thioacetone and its stench being able to reach around whole towns and stuff like that, it's got some weight to it. It's pretty valid, I would say. Yeah. Needless to say, I never got to make a full pound of thioacetone. Despite having the equipment triple bagged and boxed up in the back corner of my yard, most of the neighborhood got to experience the horrifying smell that once sickened a German town. The interesting thing, however, was that the odor didn't seriously impact most people. After speaking and apologizing profusely to most of my neighbors, only one of them found the smell truly unbearable. 
The others honestly thought it was just natural gas. Hence why police had the bomb squad and fire department on the line. And knowing that I have this YouTube channel, many of them found the whole situation quite entertaining, including a few of the officers and firemen. This isn't an attempt to minimize the incident that I caused. What I do for fun shouldn't be impacting anybody's comfort or well-being. And since this happened last August, I've stayed away from creating obnoxious smells altogether, at least near other people. But it is an interesting comparison between people in different times and areas of the world. To a lot of people, like me, my friends, and even Nigel over on Nile Red, the smell is just another sulfurous, oniony smell similar to natural gas. But to a few, like Nile Red's cameraman, my one neighbor, and apparently 19th century Germans who didn't have anything to compare it to, the smell is downright unbearable. So, what happened after the incident? Well, I isolated as much of the crude trithioacetone as I could, which is still by far the largest amount ever shown on the internet, and I sealed it off in a plastic bottle submerged in liquid bleach. No more smell escaped, and I went on my merry way. Kinda. Despite everything that happened, I still really wanted to see if I could produce a sample of thioacetone monomer. And call me a psychopath, but I was hell-bent on following through. Away from all human life, of course. So, as with most of my stinky misadventures, I called up a friend, and we went out to an abandoned campground to finally put the thioacetone legends to rest. Take two, hopefully the camera doesn't shut down this time. So, like I tried to say before the camera shut down before, um, we've got the trithioacetone that I prepared before, right here, my special little bottle. And basically what we'll be doing today is distilling this with a very janky test tube setup onto some dry ice so that it'll hopefully stabilize the thioacetone monomer and get to see what that smells like in bulk concentration. So this is Niall. Uh, we actually well, go to the University of Oklahoma together and he's agreed to come out here and participate in some of the fun stuff for this video since my other victims are absent. <laughs> <laughs> Under uh, reasons. <laughs> yeah. So I guess for now let's just I'll give you a chance to sort of just smell the trithioacetone. This one is supposed to not be too bad. Let me get some gloves on. So, thioacetone mono, uh, this is the trimer. So, trithioacetone. Oh. Hmm. You smell that? That's a, it's an odd smell. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> I see. You see where we're going with this? I see where we're going with this. I don't know if I like where we're going with this. This is why I'm a victim, isn't it? Yep. Okay. So. <laughs> All right. So, what are your uh, what are your thoughts on the the regular stuff? Eh, not bad. You know, about a two out of ten. Two out of ten. Two out of ten on the like terribleness scale. Terribleness. You know, we're, we're starting off pretty tame. That was. Is there anything that you can compare it to? Sulfur. Just sulfur. Because you you get a lot of that rotten. Yeah. Smell. I still smell right now. But yeah. I think this is gonna go downhill, isn't it? <laughs> in theory. <laughs> <laughs> Fingers crossed. Yeah. The last people I had out here that smelled it basically said it smelled kind of like onion almost. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of like that. It's also sort of like natural gas almost. It's adjacent to those sorts of smells, at least in my opinion. Yeah, no, I think you're right. If you imagine just eggs and onions. Yeah. Just in a bin. That's just, <laughs> yeah. like it's, it's not faint, but it's like, okay, that's, I can yeah. deal with that. It's quite potent. After that quick introduction to the trimer, we began the dreaded distillation. I didn't want to putrefy my good glassware, so I used a propane torch to craft an old test tube into this abomination. A receiving test tube was allowed to cool in the dry ice bath. The abomination was loaded with trithioacetone, and once the camera was ready, I absolutely blasted it with my blowtorch, making sure to superheat the thin neck where the vapor would pass. Very quickly, the solution darkened, and a reddish distillate began to collect in the receiver. In theory, this should have been mostly pure thioacetone, although a small amount likely did oxidize from the tiny bit of air left in the test tube. It took a while, but eventually, all the material came over, leaving us with an angry, reddish-orange liquid 
along with a bit of frozen orange solid. If this were simply trithioacetone, it should have completely frozen, since its melting point is barely below room temperature. Thioacetone, on the other hand, melts at negative 55 degrees, and would have taken a bit longer to freeze in my mostly depleted dry ice bath. So, given the color and melting point characteristics, I would say we most likely produced thioacetone. Not perfectly pure, of course, but pure enough to judge how truly horrible it was. Ooh! Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm. Mm. That's, that's... It's not... A... It's not very different. No. It's not... It's just kind of... It's just stronger. <laughs> More... It's kind of like a... Almost like cheesiness to it. Mmm... That's weird. If you would imagine, like, a rotting eggs benedict, or like an omelette. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a... Just... It's kind of like just the, the regular stuff, except a little bit worse. Oh, man. You huh. had to waft that to my face the first time. You could just hold it and it's <laughs> I got it in the right position now. Ooh. Of course. And in the direction of my face. <laughs> it's in both of our faces. I don't think... It's not worse than the selenium stuff. They're pretty similar in terms of how strong the smell is. Mm -hmm. But the selenium stuff was arguably a lot grosser. It smelled like sewage and, like, bad garlic, stuff like that. Body odor, kind of. <laughs> it's like that sort of range of sulfury bad smells. This is just kind of like natural gas leaks. It's a lot, it's a lot like what we did last time, honestly. I don't know if I, I don't know if I was expecting, but this isn't very different from the first time I smelled thioacetone. It's not really that bad. It's not, like, vomitously offensive. Mm. So, thioacetone, I can still smell it. Very strong, but not, not the worst thing in the world. There's a, hel yeah, there's a helicopter and other vehicles coming, so I think we'll cut the video off here. Like and subscribe. Do Lab coats out. <laughs> All right, well, I really don't know what else to say. Thioacetone is a bit worse as its monomer, being more rotten and cheesy, but at least to us, the smell still really wasn't that unbearable. And this is coming from two completely different guys who hadn't smelled anything sulfurous or thioacetone related for over a month. So it's not like we were nose blind. And honestly, this lines up with a lot of people's reactions. Nile Red didn't think it was bad, my friend Matt actually liked it, and most of my family only found it moderately unpleasant. That said, I would like to emphasize just how insanely potent the smell truly is. While it might not be vomit-inducing to everyone, it is extremely pervasive. Niall and I tested it, and that small vial was still detectable over 300 feet downwind, which lines up pretty well with my initial results from 2022. And the trimer is nothing to joke about either. Opening the bottle even slightly causes whole rooms to absolutely reek. And despite wearing gloves and not even touching a noticeable amount, my hands smelled enough like it after my experiments for my whole family to notice for over a day. And worst of all, the smell lingers in your nose, even hours after indirectly smelling it. So yeah, even though worse smells certainly exist, thioacetone's power shouldn't be taken lightly. But wait, what's that I hear? You don't believe me? Well, if you want a chance to experience the horrors of thioacetone for yourself, or simply grab a cool collectible, I've got you covered. If you live in the United States, and donate $20 or more to my channel, or join my Patreon as a $15 plus dollar patron, I'll send you a small ampule of the trithioacetone I made in this video. The ampules are perfectly sealed, and won't smell unless you break them open. Which I only recommend doing outside, unless you want your house to reek for a long time. Plus, with the amounts that I'll be sending, you shouldn't be at risk of stinking up a whole neighborhood. Just be sure to include your name and address, so I know where to mail it. And that's pretty much all I've got for today's video. As always, be sure to like and subscribe to my channel, because I've got a whole lot of amazing content coming that you do not want to miss. Like, for example, turning bug spray into a band performance enhancer, placing a 360 camera in the middle of a tornado, and uncovering the Coca-Cola secret formula so that I can make my own Coke. So yeah, be sure you stick around. As always, a huge thanks goes out to all my supporters on Patreon. Without them, I truly wouldn't be where I am today. Remember to like, share, and subscribe, and I'll catch you next time. Lab Coats, out.